A very warm welcome to each and every one of you to the UN Global Compact Academy session on advancing women's leadership in climate action. I'm Vaishali Nigam Sinha, Chief Sustainability Officer at Renew Power, one of India's leading uh, clean energy companies and the first renewable energy company to list on NASDAQ. At Renew, I drive ESG and diversity and inclusion initiatives are a top priority. Before we start today's session, I would like to make a couple of important announcements. For today's session, simultaneous uh, translation is available in five languages. Attendees can simply select by clicking on the world emoji on the bottom of your screen. Instructions are shown on the site. Closed captions in English are also available. Before we formally kick off the session, we're going to hear a recorded message from Sanda Ojambo, CEO and Executive Director of the United Nations Global Compact. I regret to share that Her Excellency Maria Carolina Schmidt Zaldivar, Minister of Environment of Chile and President of COP25, who was also slated to share a video, is unfortunately in COVID quarantine. I would like to acknowledge the Minister's leadership and efforts to place gender at the heart of climate discussions. We also look forward to hearing from her in future sessions. I will now request the tech team to please play Sanders video message. It is a pleasure to greet and welcome participants from all around the world to this important session linking two key global priorities, climate action and gender equality. While the world has made great strides towards some of the 17 sustainable development goals, Progress on others has even stalled or reversed. Income inequality continues to rise and global hunger is increasing. Systemic injustices based on race, ethnicity and gender persist. According to data from the Women's Empowerment Principles Gender Gap Analysis Tool, only 39% of companies have an organizational-wide gender equality strategy in place to identify priorities and areas where further improvement in gender equity is needed. As for the climate emergency that we all face, global temperatures have already risen 1.1 degrees Celsius. Without immediate action, they could rise by more than three degrees by the year 2100 with catastrophic consequences. Our collective efforts over the next few years are absolutely critical to preventing runaway climate crises and building a more inclusive and equitable future. While the global climate emergency threatens everyone on the planet, women are disproportionately affected. Systemic barriers prevent women from effectively preparing for and responding to climate impacts. For lasting solutions and climate justice to become a reality, women must have a place at the table. Indeed, if we fail to include half of the world's population, our efforts to build a more sustainable planet are doomed to fail. Harnessing the private sector to tackle climate change is one of the key priorities of the UN Global Compact. Ambitious business leaders the world over are recognizing that they don't have to choose between climate action and the bottom line. On the contrary, taking climate action is the best way to build healthier, thriving communities, businesses, and economies. Yet women are still underrepresented in climate-related decision-making resulting in processes that overlook their specific needs and contributions. It is only through inclusive decision-making that we can reap inclusive outcomes. We need to elevate and amplify women's voices, especially those who are already experiencing the harmful effects of climate change. Women's expertise, innovation, and leadership at all levels are key to delivering not only the Paris Agreement's goals, but also the private sector's climate response. Business has an important role to play in tackling climate change as a gendered issue by delivering climate resilient solutions that focus on women and contribute to gender just transition to a net zero economy. We have neither the time nor the luxury to maintain business as usual. I urge you to accelerate progress towards the 2030 agenda, recognizing that gender equality is not only an end goal, but an enabler to help us make progress across all the SDGs. I am confident that you will. And let me remind you that the UN Global Compact is here to work with you side by side 
uniting business for a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. We couldn't have asked for a more powerful message uh, and a better way to start this session. Thank you for underscoring, Sandra, the urgency for mitigating the climate crisis and the importance of integrating gender issues within climate policies and planning for it to be truly effective. As WHO rightly highlighted, climate change continues to be the greatest threat of the 21st century. As the climate crisis deepens, it is also exacerbating existing socioeconomic inequalities. Today, it is no secret that climate change is not gender agnostic. Rather, women and girls bear a far, far higher risk of being affected, be it in terms of physical health, livelihood, food security, domestic violence, and the list is really long. And it's rather unfortunate. Let's look at how. Let's look at what is driving this situation. Due to underlying socioeconomic, technical, and legal barriers, women are less adaptive and resilient to impacts of climate change. Women are involved in up to 2.5 times unpaid caregiving than men do, making them vulnerable to effects of climate change such as water shortage and many other such problems. Only 47% of women have an account at a formal financial institution compared to 55% of men. While women represent nearly 50% of the agricultural workers in some countries, they represent only 20% of landowners. Without bank accounts and financial resources, women cannot easily diversify their livelihoods or access capital before and after climate related disasters. Even today, we have discriminatory laws restricting the participation of women in the economy. Women are not allowed to work in certain factory jobs in 41 economies. And in 18 economies, they cannot get a job without their spouse's permission. Women also have far lower access to technology and capacity building resources such as internet and mobile phones, and in general, minimal say in decision making at the family level. It is hence clear that climate crisis cannot be truly averted without considering gender issues. Climate action needs to be gender responsive and women need to play a more central role in climate movements, shaping the agenda and shaping it at a leadership level, which I would very much like to see at the COP. Women can act as powerful change agents when it comes to developing critical climate solutions, be it by inventing new technologies, running sustainable business models, managing renewables amongst others, Involving women will lend the much needed diversity, innovation required for climate negotiations and solutions. It is now a proven fact that when women are in positions of power, both climate and sustainability issues get better attention. Thus, it is important that steps are taken to raise the representation of women in national climate delegations and dialogues. It is also crucial to push a wider adoption of the gender action plan, which was framed at the COP25. This will help address two issues. One, mainstreaming of gender issues in national climate policy design and planning. Two, equal and full-fledged participation of women in climate action leadership. However, for just and inclusive transitions, we need private businesses to also advance the cause of women and net, not just the governments, the private sector and the government have to work hand in hand. In this context, I would like to spend some time talking about a research carried out by BSR, a global nonprofit organization that talks about the intersection between climate change and women's empowerment. The research findings build a strong case for business to address climate change and ensure a gender balance and just transition to a net zero economy. By leveraging their traditional knowledge and expertise in sustainable practices, women can help businesses become more resilient against climate shocks. For practical and effective climate change mitigation, we must unleash the knowledge and capability of women, especially in business. This involves, but is not limited to giving voice to women who have gone through impact of climate change and sensitizing male decision makers. 
a, ju a, ju a gender just transition will require businesses to explore gender dimensions across sectors and assess the impact of local communities. It will also require business and governments to provide women with equal opportunities, tools, and technology to support women and ensure equal economic empowerment. The research urges companies to work towards a gender just transition by focusing on three important levers. First one, act. To place women at the center of all internal climate resilience approaches and solutions in particular, providing women access to training, finance, and technologies, all three very critical. Enable women throughout the value chain and broader community to effectively respond to climate related events by linking them with local networks and partners which can serve as mutual support mechanisms to strengthen climate resilience. Third, influence. Underlying inequalities such as the lack of decision making, power, or land rights that exacerbate the disproportionate negative impacts women face in the context of a changing climate are all very important steps which must be taken. Recognizing this, the United Nations steered a number of high impact initiatives, such as the C Climate Ambition Accelerator, the Science Based Target Initiative, Business Ambition for 1.5 Degrees, Target Gender Equality, to integrate corporate action and gender equality. The UN Global Compacts called to clear, measurable, and public commitments and targets by business leaders is also emblematic to the potential of the business institutes to accelerate the efforts led by multi multilateral governmental and civil society organizations. During the sessions today, we will explore why women are disproportionately affected by climate crisis. We will also dive deep into and discuss importance of ensuring gender balance and advancing women's leadership and climate strategies and just transition plans. We will learn from our guests with great expertise what specific actions organizations can and should take to, prior, to prioritize gender balance energy transition and support climate entrepreneurs and business owners ahead of the much awaited COP26. Needless to say, this discussion is relevant across all regions, but needs to be localized to specific context. All right, now we're going to have a poll an audience poll, and um, I'm going to ask all of you a question, uh, which is, what is the global average percentage of female graduates of STEM in higher education? Okay, can we see the results? Right. All right, the correct answer though is 35%. Yeah, it's, it's um, anyway, thank you for that. Um, of uh, participating in the poll, and um, you know, let's 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 hope that a wider pool of women, uh, STEM graduates, will pave way for women to be better integrated into climate-related sectors. We really need it. So now, on that positive note, it is now time to kick off our first five side chat for today. The topic, as all of you know, is women's representation and uh, leadership in climate-related uh, processes and a just transition. As I mentioned, women are traditionally underrepresented in climate-related processes and decision-making, which results in their specific knowledge and needs being overlooked, and overall climate policies and just transition strategies being less effective. There are, however, many initiatives that are challenging that norm and taking bold steps in ensuring women's participation in the climate dialogues and action. Joining me today are two business leaders to talk about these transformational initiatives. But before I begin the chat, it's time to play a short video clip. 
Mother Nature really does need her daughters. More of us standing up to be collaborative, inclusive, legacy-minded. Home Unbound was founded to create a global network of women with a STEM background willing and able to lead and solve our planet's greatest challenges. Hi, I'm Fabian Dantner, dreamer, co-founder and CEO of Homeward Bound. It is with a great pleasure that we announce the opening up of Homeward Bound 7 applications. This is the seventh cohort of women we are working with to build a global network of women leading with a STEM background for a sustainable future. Hello, my name is Joyce Lee, and I'm the Head of Policy and Projects at the Global Wind Energy Council. With our partner organization, the Global Women's Network for the Energy Transition, we are proud to co-organize the Women in Wind Global Leadership Program. Women in Wind works at the nexus of SDGs 5 and 7 to ensure that the next generation of women leaders can chart their path through the global wind industry. We work particularly in emerging markets worldwide, especially in Latin America, Africa, and Southeast Asia, through a program of mentorship, networking, knowledge transfer, and study tours. So please find out more about how to join and support Women in Wind by visiting us on the GWEC website. Thank you. I think those were two great uh, videos, one by Homeward Bound and one uh, on Women in Wind. Um, uh, after those uh, inspirational uh, videos, it's time to get to a conversation with industry leaders. We are fortunate to be joined by Miguel Angel Alonso of Asiona Energia and Jackie Mohapi of Kenya Airways. I request both the panelists to briefly introduce themselves to our audience. Welcome. So if I could request Miguel to go first and then Jackie, please. And if you could go on unmute, please. I'm here. Yeah, hi, we can hear you, Miguel. Please go ahead, if you could introduce yourself briefly. Oh, introduce myself. Oh, sorry. I, 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 I think uh, somebody introduced uh, me. Uh, uh, I am a CEO of Acciona Energia Mexico and uh, Central America and Caribbean. Uh, uh, Acciona is a, a renewable uh, energy company. And we are working in this part of the world. Uh, uh, <clears throat> building an operational uh, operation uh, uh, energy project. And after that, I explain uh, a lot of things about uh, our capabilities and our uh, project here in, in Mexico and in the region. Thank you very much. Thanks, Miguel. Chucky? Good morning, good evening, good day to all the participants. My name is Jackie Mohati. I head marketing, brand, and sustainability at uh, Kenya Airways, I'm sure, and I hope all of you have heard of Kenya. So we are a national carrier operating um, uh, across the globe, Africa, Europe, uh, Americas, and Asia, uh, with our core purpose being to contribute to the sustainable development of Africa. So we operate uh, with the clarity and premise that uh, we exist for more than profit and we have to make impact in society and uh, contribute to the overall global um, issues that need to be addressed, especially when you look at uh, the UN um, SDGs and um, we align a lot of operations to that. So looking forward to engaging for, further. Thanks, thanks Jackie. Um, for those, both of you, thank you for your brief introductions. Miguel, I'll direct my first question to you as Yona has said, it's 1.5 degree aligned SPTs as well as a target aiming for gender balance across the company. What are some of the key aspects when making such a strategic decision you consider and how are these two targets connected and linked to your overall business strategy? Well, uh, difficult question. It's very difficult to, to join uh, the two target. Uh, how I say before, uh, Hello everyone, uh, Acciona is a 100% uh, renewable 
Energy Company, uh, company uh, as a global and a major player in energy sector. Uh, Aciona is deeply committed uh, uh, with fighting and in a decisive manner global warning. All of our assets are uh, renewable, mainly uh, PV plants and, and wind projects. Uh, for that, uh, this has been a great contribution uh, to join uh, worldwide effort to limit the temperature increase even further to 0.5 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> How is it uh, possible to, to join uh, this, uh, these two targets? Uh, Acciona's commitment is uh, reaching uh, this uh, goal, consider uh, also other positive uh, externally uh, that these objectives uh, bring out. For example, uh, climate change education, we are involved in, in a lot of uh, uh, <laughs> climate change uh, program. For example, we created a special uh, books uh, for the uh, schools in 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 Mexico, and we prepare a teacher uh, to to learn the the, the, the child's uh, uh, all the, the the aspect around the the the, the environment and the reduction uh, to the, uh, the the impact the the, the humanity over the planet. Uh, public awareness, uh, public uh, participation, and uh, we contribution uh, to reduce the, the global uh, gender. Um, I would like to, 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 to join this target, uh, explain different programs. For example, uh, uh, we, we are the sponsor in the Homeward Bonds. Uh, this program is uh, uh, a, a special uh, travel uh, uh, with a lot of uh, scientists, uh, women scientists, to travel to, to the Antarctic to combat the, the climate change and the analyze uh, the different effects uh, the climate change in the, in, over the world, but uh, especially in the Antarctic. For example, all other, other important things around the renewable energy, uh, including the climate change, is uh, the recent study uh, conducted uh, in insulated uh, uh, communities. So, the, the access to the renewable energy uh, contribute to, to reduce the, the gender inequalities. For example, uh, uh, with access to the energy, the, the women uh, uh, <clears throat> provide uh, access to the domestic uh, infrastructure, ventilation, lighting, and allowing uh, women empowerment. We have a other special program. The, the, the program is called uh, Luz en Casa Oaxaca in Spanish uh, is lighting in, uh, at home uh, in English. And we, uh, we have uh, put uh, 12,000 12, panels uh, in Oaxaca and Chiapas in, in, in the mountain in, in communities with, without access to the electricity. And with this panel, we provide energy uh, uh, to these uh, 12,000 uh, families, around uh, three, 30, 36,000 uh, uh, people, uh, 36, people uh, 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 with, uh, like the, with this program, uh, they can <clears throat> access to the energy and uh, they have uh, coffee in the because morning. You, I think that's, that's, that really gives us a great glimpse of the kind of work you're doing. And congratulations. I think you know, the fact that you're engaging with youth and uh, contributing in such a strategic manner, and I'll come back to you with another opportunity to address this. I wanted to quickly hop over also to uh, Jackie to perhaps uh, ask a question, but thanks a lot, Miguel, for that uh, answer. Um, um, Jackie, um, Kenya Airways is not new to targeting, uh, to target setting uh, space either, as you've set a target to improve female representation by 25% by 2025. Furthermore, you are signatory to the WEP and are now participating 
in uh, TGE and climate ambition. So all the right things, SBTs, all the right ticks. How will you make sure these two agendas don't exist in silos and are taking gender equality into account from the very beginning when setting and meeting your emission reduction targets? If you could take perhaps three minutes for your answer, I would appreciate it to keep time. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, so I think uh, as Kenya Airways, we come from the premise where we are very clear of the interdependence nature between sectors uh, that calls for partnerships that will help us to manage the silos that exist between um, industries and sectors. Um, with the IATA 25 by 2025, we are addressing uh, very industry specific issues where we want to ensure that uh, women are represented equally at all the levels. And as we do that with the female representation, it's the clarity of um, the level of interdependence and finding a way of interlinking our systems with the, the communities, specifically that's where the world economic, uh, I mean, the women empowerment principles come in, finding interlinkages, the interlinkages in the system to ensure that our strategic corporate objectives are also being met in the communities um, activities that we support. So as a quick example, our carbon emissions uh, trading um, platform is set or other activities set in such a way that uh, internally as Kenya Airways, with the IATA 25 by 25, you have pilots who are flying and we have consumers who are required to volunteer their credits. So we'll set targets and uh, contribute these targets to, I mean, uh, trade the carbon, uh, the carbons to communities. We trade and uh, invest in Kasigao. Kasigao is a community in uh, Voi. And as part of the target set setting, we have to ensure that there's women representation in the projects. So the interlinkages and the silo mentality here then is um, managed by ensuring that from the onset, when we are setting our targets for measurement, we have clarity of how we want the carbon offsetting uh, programs to impact the community. So for example, in Kasigao, when we go back and we're doing our, re our reporting, we have to set clarity on how many women do we want to see educated? How many women-led businesses do we want to see um, supported? And uh, how are we then improving the integration of women into all of this? So I think for me, the critical thing is, um, that clarity of uh, the catalyst to promote an integrated uh, approach to measuring climate change, addressing it from both a corporate level and integrating it into the community level with set targets of uh, what it is as um, women uh, representation and women, uh, what numbers are required from a women representation perspective to ensure that inclusion. Because again, the question becomes, what is the financial impact of the lack of inclusion of women? So everything we do is from the premise of uh, interdependencies, um, partnerships, because we understand we have to partner with the uh, other institutions that uh, have similar objectives and also just to scale the impact and interlinking the system so that each party is playing its role in contributing to both the, the growth of uh, women representation, but while doing that, addressing the climate change issues and addressing it at the specific level. So whether it's at a corporate leadership level when it comes to setting targets and uh, prioritizing the business way of uh, doing things or at a community level uh, from implementation in ensuring that every project that is implemented has that representation and directly links to the outcome of um, um, the set objectives, I, I guess, that address the global SDG concerns that uh, will not only impact uh, the organization, but uh, the overall uh, globe. So that is how we approach it in a nutshell. Excellent, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, honestly, what you're doing is fantastic. And, you know, people travel by, uh, you know, Kenya Airways. So there is a huge amount of, uh, you know, impact, not only with partners and not only with people who travel, but other role models, you know, in other countries. So, you know, good job and, you know, good job for that strategic approach and the 
uh, you know, uh, advocacy and the amplification you're doing of the work. So, um, you know, appreciate that. Uh, and thank you for being role models and leaders. Miguel, back to you. Uh, you know, in many industries like yours, we often hear, um, you know, the excuse that there are just not enough women out there that would qualify or are interested in positions. Could you please share how you're working to foster um, um, the STEM community, a uh, greater engagement of women in STEM? How do you counter the misperception that energy related roles only exist in re remote areas and uh, don't necessarily offer for work-life balance, which often women you know, seek? And my question is, of course, men should seek the same. So why should it be any different for women? Okay, <clears throat> two different questions. Uh, and I would like to speak about two different uh, special programs in ACCIONA. One of the programs for the one question uh, is then, uh, to improve the, 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 the STEM community is uh, uh, the program uh, called uh, Energia del Istmo de Tehuantepec, uh, Energy of Ismus of Tehuantepec. This program is about uh, <coughs> uh, employees, uh, 10 uh, young women, uh, women engineers, uh, recently graduated, and we uh, want to to do this kind of, of profile because we want to to share with them a, a special tour, a specific uh, philosophy, and uh, additional education, mentoring, and a, a specific program to empower uh, them. <clears throat> with all of this element, this uh, women engineer will have opportunity. Uh, that they want, uh, and uh, we want to 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 give the the then the, the the tools for they at, uh, will achieve a technical position, a staff position, including uh, ma management uh, leader, and uh, we put uh, no limit uh, for for them. And traditionally, in the Ismus of the one the peg, uh, there are a lot of uh, renewable project and. A lot of companies has only men in, in the staff and in the technical in the technical position. And with this program, we want to 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 be a, a example uh, for all the companies in the Ismus of the one Pest. And we want to to the rest of the company replicate this program and improve the, the empower uh, the empowerment uh, women uh, in the Ismus because uh, traditionally in the Ismus of the one Pest. Is, uh, is knowledge uh, for the matriarchy, uh, matriarchy culture, and with this program, we want to to <clears throat> to, to to share with the, the world the the Ismus of Tehuantepec uh, uh, will be not only uh, famous with the matriarchy cultural uh, culturally, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, 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 the Ismus of Tehuantepec will knowledge. Uh, uh, with the, the, the empower uh, women and the, the matriarchy in, in economy and in technical program. For that, uh, I, I, uh, we, I, I, I think uh, we, we think that this program is uh, contributed uh, very, very high uh, to the STEM uh, community. And the other question is uh, uh, for the communities, uh, 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 so far from the 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 the, 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 the cities or so far for the the industrial places, uh, the other program is in Sonora. Is uh, uh, we, we call uh, call it uh, this program uh, Energia Rosa, uh, Pink Energy. This program is uh, employment em employees uh, for uh, forty women in our PV plants in Sonora. In the desert uh, in Sonora, in Puerto Libertad, is uh, a community uh, to 200 kilometers away from the closest city, and we uh, we help to reduce inequality uh, in this in this community because the opportunities in this uh, in this area uh, is, is is very difficult. The climate change effect uh, here is is very high. 
uh, is the desert. Um, the, uh, they uh, work uh, in early in the morning and leave the, the activities early in the moon uh, because we want to, to combine uh, the, the, the family activities because in, in this program we have single mother, uh, students, uh, domestic worker, and uh, at the same time, and as the other uh, program, we, we want to replicate that uh, in, in, in all our uh, project because the community normal, the community, the communities around the renewable energy, uh, uh, there are uh, in difficult conditions because I, I would like to say always uh, when uh, in, in, in the places when high re resources, uh, wind and sun, and water, the light is very difficult. And with this kind of, of program uh, for these 40 women, uh, we want to, 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 to be uh, also an example for, 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 for the, the rest of the, 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 the companies and replicate uh, that. Great, thanks Miguel, thanks, thanks for showing the way, thanks for taking the leadership here. And I, I, I can't, uh, you know, um, you know, I, I run a renewable energy company in India as well, and I can't emphasize the importance of busting this myth. So very important for all of us to work together to understand their challenges, but, uh, you know, there are opportunities as well. Uh, Jackie, coming to you, you've been serving in leadership roles across regions in a very male-dominated industry. Uh, what are the barriers you face? And can you show some examples on how to create avenues for women and to make it easier for them to be able to follow the path. Wow, that, that's an interesting one. I think you would, uh, the, the typical sort of um, barriers are not any new to what has been uh, spoken about before from the overall lack of a voice of uh, women and at the table women not speaking out. Uh, to sometimes the perception of incompetence um, and maybe unfair treatment in the roles and lack of support. But I'm very lucky to work in a space that at least those have not been barriers that have uh, stopped, uh, stopped uh, any of the people in the leadership uh, roles. And uh, I think the critical thing is to just understand how to tackle the stereotypes. Um, as women, it's important that we learn to sort of uh, be aggressive long-time learners. Let us be as informed in our areas of expertise just as a man so that you're then not judged on the basis of your gender, but on the basis of what it is from a skill set perspective you bring to the table. But even as I say that, it's, it then becomes critical to tackle some of this stereotype by supporting other women, working with other women, and um, handling, hand holding them in our leadership positions. And whether it's a mentor, coach, and sponsor role where we take them through what we've been through, uh, we speak about them in uh, rooms of influence where we, we hear that there are skill sets that are required that we know can be done by the same woman. Um, and more importantly, just uh, taking on leadership roles so that we are also at the table when decisions are being made that will directly have an impact on us as a women. Um, and uh, staying positive, staying positive and knowing that we actually can do what it is that can be done. And I think for us, the practical avenues we've created, and I'm very lucky to work for an organization that uh, takes this seriously, is um, they've given women opportunities to lead other women and achieve great results in purely women-led uh, setups, which therefore demonstrates that uh, you can still achieve results even with a fully led uh, women's uh, team, even though from a gender sort of uh, balance perspective, that not, will not be ideal. And also just the drive of uh, professionalism. Um, I am very lucky to be in an organization that also nurtures and uh, recognizes the need to equip women with the specific leadership skills that gives them the, um, the what is it called? The, the, the role at the table to articulate the issues that uh, need to be taken into consideration when strategies are being defined, when decisions are being uh, 
um, made when targets are being set that are also realistic and very applicable to us as women. And um, the imposter syndrome, which is this women feeling doubtful about themselves. I think when as women, we are also at the table and we, we go to the table from a competence perspective and not from a tokenism gender perspective, it helps a lot of women to fight that imposter syndrome of self-doubt. Because I guess if you see a woman pilot, for example, we are very lucky we have a good representation of um, uh, women in our pilot's uh, fraternity. And just imagine the hope that that kind of uh, brings up in a child who sees a woman or in another woman who feels I'm not able to, to do the same. Um, and I think we take it very seriously um, as in KQ as women leadership to understand that it is upon us to make sure that we, we kind of correct the narrative and kill the stereotypes by demonstra demonstrating practically what it is and what the benefits of having a woman at the table are. And uh, more importantly, just understanding that we both bring something that is very critical to the table when it comes to tackling issues that affect all of us. We are, we are on the same planet. And if we are to tackle uh, any um, major issues around um, the SDGs, you must include women. Absolutely. Otherwise, uh, you will be dealing with one part and ignoring the other part and uh, vice versa. Yes, you cannot ignore the 50% of the workforce, which is right there waiting to get engaged. Women must walk ahead and have self-confidence, believe in themselves, and not only be led by women leaders, but also male leaders, because there's so many more of them and there's so many more opportunities. Thanks for making those fantastic points. Really appreciate it. To wrap up this session, I'll ask one question of both of you. Can you name one female leader in climate action that inspires you? If I could start with Miguel and then Jackie. Uh, uh, I don't. I, I don't have a, a famous. I don't have a famous uh, a woman leader, but I have a, a, one of my colleagues is uh, Alicia Lizarraga. Uh, is a biology in Acción signed 25 years ago, and she put on me in the in the correct way to. To, to know uh, what the important uh, the environment and the, the objectives for save the planet uh, is for all of the, the person or the people over the world. And I don't have a famous leader, but I have uh, a, a important mentor in my company. Very good. And it was just one name of a female leader. So you did well, Miguel. Thank you so much. Um, Jackie, over to you. Unfortunately, mine is not going to be one person. I'm sure the, the whole world is waiting for me to say Wangari Mapai, but I'd really like to be clear that uh, there are very many heroes, of course. We have a group of lady pilots at Kenya Airways that are very passionate about climate change. They understand the role that they play in um, um, this um, specific issue, and they come together voluntarily to consistently participate in community initiatives and uh, participate in driving change and uh, um, even in at personal level, going out to schools to actually talk about this impact. So these are actually my unsung heroes quietly who impact a lot uh, from a very personal space uh, because of the understanding of uh, what it is the industry has the ability to do and their positions in our society can actually drive. So it's the lady group pilots at Kenya Airways who are really passionate about climate change issues. Absolutely. And so thank you. And so the moral of the story here is uh, we don't have enough female leaders who stand out as much as we'd like them to. We need many more of them for names to just pop up there. But all of you are right. We need many more women because it's these millions of women who are going to then become leaders who we all can look up to. Thank you so much, uh, Miguel, Jackie. It was such a pleasure having you here and listening to your stories and your commitment. And um, thank you once again for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.
All right, that was the end of uh, the first fireside chat. Um, you know, we will hop over to our second fireside chat, which is supporting women entrepreneurs and women-led climate solutions. Um, uh, so now uh, what I'd like to do is, um, you know, just set the theme a little bit. Um, you know, women are already spearheading climate solutions through their innovations, expertise, and leadership. To kick us off, we would like to share with you some tangible examples of how some trailblazing women are leading the way as entrepreneurs once again, like before. Um, uh, we begin talking to our guests. I will request the tech team to play a couple of short videos that talk about some, some of these women, uh, climate entrepreneurs who are really making a difference. I founded 412 Food Rescue after I learned a crazy fact that America wastes 40% of its food supply, almost half. And on the other side of that, we know many go hungry, not only in countries like where I grew up, but right here. We feed landfills better than we feed people. So much so that food waste is the second largest cause of greenhouse gas emissions affecting us all. 412 Food Rescue is technology. In the same way we use Uber Eats to order and deliver food, we match excess food from grocery stores and restaurants to NGOs that can use them. And we mobilize drivers to deliver the food. And since 2015, we have redirected 7 million meals from 600 grocery stores and restaurants to over 700 NGOs in five cities, preventing four million pounds of carbon emissions. RISE 2030 is a community-led initiative that focuses on empowering women and youth while improving living conditions through access to education and employment. RISE 2030 launched the first all-women solar team in Lebanon to challenge gender stereotypes in the male-dominated construction sector. Getting women into leadership positions means that you have to start young and build a pipeline. Programs like ours form a foundation of opportunity for other women to not only get the initial training, but to experience opportunities for leadership. I'm convinced that every experience is a lesson and that success comes from experience and this was one of the wonderful experiences in my life and now I am uh, the trainer and supervisor for the new group and this is the beginning and still have uh, a long way to go. Momentum of Change awardee uh, Rise 2030 from Lebanon, V Empower SDE Challenge awardee Leah Lezan, uh, Lezerando from USA Philippines. Uh, fantastic films. Thanks for showing them to us. And there were some really inspiring words and visuals. And it's always good to see women leaders uh, in the climate space making a difference because you know what? It affects them the most. Now to begin our fireside chat, um, you know, how is it that we can foster more women-led climate solutions? We have with us today Habiba Ali of Society Renewable Energies and Sihan Urhan of TSKB. Once again, I request the panelists to introduce themselves to our audience, Habiba and then Sihan. Hello everyone, thank you, Michelle. My name is, uh, as has been said, Habiba Ali. I run a business in Northern Nigeria in the city called Katrina. Um, I sell solar renewable, uh, renewable energy solutions to people in communities and uh, peri-urban areas. We've been deploying solutions for over five years, uh, 10 years, and um, we've actually um, helped. Our solutions have helped to reduce climate effects by up to 200,000 tons per annum because um, we sell um, improved cook stoves that have been used as the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, uh, projects. Uh, we are currently working on deploying solutions like mini grids, um, so the uh, solar home kits and improve the tools to people in the Great. Thanks, Abiba. Thank you. Sihan. Yeah, uh, thanks, Vasali. Uh, my name is Jian Han, and 
I serve as manager at Industrial Development Bank of Turkey, TSKB, uh, economic research team. Uh, TSKB is Turkey's first uh, private loan development and investment bank. And um, the bank has been supporting su Turkey's sustainable growth with its deep experience, as well as the uh, broad array of corporate banking, investment banking, and also uh, consulting services. Um, I contribute content-wise to uh, gender equality working group that the bank formed to follow up developments in gender issues, plans, and uh, carries out actions and potential projects that the bank can undertake both within and outside the company. Thank you. Thanks, Jihan. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions each. I'd request you to keep your responses to two to three minutes in the interest of time, and we'll come back to another round of questions, and we can cover the remaining points then, if that's okay with both of you. My first question goes to Habiba. What the videos have shown is that women are clearly not lacking in the innovation, creativity, or drive when it comes to leading climate-focused businesses. What they're lacking, however, are equal opportunities, such as access to finance, inclusion in global supply chains, for procurement, et cetera. What have you experienced to be the main barriers for women's entrepreneurship in the climate or environment sector? Okay, so thank you, Shirley. I think that um, what we are lacking currently is really not um, uh, much as, as you can, you know, very well tell, like you said, um, but, uh, you know, even the willpower from beginning is something that uh, is something that we need to actually really look into. And when I say willpower, I'm also referring to the fact that a lot of women would love to be part of this, you know, the whole climate effect um, reduction, the whole fight against um, uh, climate change and everything. But do they even understand how to do it? And so first and foremost, it's like a foundation for a building. How do we ensure that enough women understand what it is that is happening in our, you know, um, in our climate uh, change, um, you know, uh, patterns? A lot of times we use big words, UNFCC and all of that to cover up what it truly is. But one thing we need to realize is that people that actually make or create or have the issues of climate change affecting them more are women. And most of these women who will feel the impact of this are down there in the bottom of the pyramid or in the rural areas that we do somehow do not know how to convey the message to in an appropriate way. And so that's one of the first things that's lacking. Then of course we have finance. Finance and when they do find out that, okay, yes, now we understand that there's a problem, the climate is changing, we're having issues and we need to find, fight it somehow. We need to also contribute our quota into ensuring reduction in climate change. Then they do not know how to access whatever it is that needs to be done. So if it's here and I say I'm preaching to people, plant more trees and you know, do more um, in maybe do better farming technologies, you know, reduce, um, use climate friendly technologies like um, improve cooktops that save about 70% of the tons of CO2 that will be used uh, I mean, immediately to the climate. How do they access this? How do they you know, get the funding to do that? And 70, about 80% of the people in the rural areas are not you know, financially buoyant enough to actually do anything about climate change. So if in reality, we want to do work on climate change, some of the barriers that financing and even education of the people, you know, trying to even get them to understand and even from their own pockets and their own households, speaking to their behavioral change and saying, you need to use best tools, you need to change, and then you need to follow that up with some sort of um, financial support so that they can adopt easily and then, you know, grow. So I think I'll stop here, but there's more, but I mean, I'm also very sure. conscious of the time and um, I'm also because concerned because in my city, there's been a restriction to internet and yeah. I just don't want to, you know, take too much. Thanks, Habiba. And, and you know what? The points you mentioned are pretty similar across the globe, and it's quite similar in the country I come from, and even in some of the more developed countries. So finance, uh, you know, access, all of these are very, very critical areas which require attention. Thanks for those points uh, which you raised. I'd like to now come to Chihan. Um, during the make or break time, climate solutions must be innovative, urgent, and collaborative in order to address the challenges we are facing. 
how are women-led solutions different and how can large organizations, including financial institutions, support and accelerate innovative climate solutions while applying the gender lens? You're on mute, Johan. Thank you. So sorry, so sorry, all right. Uh, thank you uh, for raising these important questions about gender impacts of uh, climate change. Uh, arguably, climate change represents one of the most complex challenges of our time. Uh, therefore, it requires proactive and uh, holistic responses. Uh, moving from gender blind to gender transformative environmental policies is an urgent action to adapt to changing environmental conditions and to come up with uh, practical solutions. So the question is about how do we make a difference in leadership effectiveness in climate change adaption and mitigation? Uh, utilizing the knowledge and capability of women presents an important opportunity to develop effective climate change solution which benefit us all. Uh, unfortunately, women are still a largely untapped resource in that matter, which restricts solutions for climate change mitigation. Uh, studies have found that uh, economic instruments uh, such as high energy prices or carbon taxes present a higher burden for women due to their high risk of poverty. Uh, moreover, women typically have less resources than men to prepare for and adapt to climate change. Uh, therefore, they cannot easily diversify their livelihoods uh, without adequate financial capital and access to technologies. Uh, on the international climate policy stage, the positive impacts women can have on their environment and on the sustainable development goals has generated widespread demand for more inclusive climate action, as well as gender sensitive financial challenges. So it's always that links between gender and climate change are nonetheless gaining greater recognition. Gender smart climate finance can help improve climate and business outcomes. While applying a gender lens to climate finance is increasingly recognized as key to effective climate outcomes, it remains challenging for women's organizations to participate in climate finance processes or access funds. Therefore, environmental funds should be more gender equality focused, but have use of policies addressing multiple issues, mainly systematic inequalities in uh, unpaid care, employment rates, pensions, income, poverty, and wealth. As a result, large organizations and financial institutions are demanding inclusive and gender sensitive approaches that demonstrate how climate finance can be channeled to have a greater impact. Research also reveals that empowering women through improved healthcare, education, and also representation in managerial positions has the potential to facilitate the way in which societies adopt the climate change. That is why large companies need a broader understanding of necessary transition. And I'd like to underline the fact that a low carbon economy is not only about the fields of energy, buildings, transport, and digitalization industries in which male employment dom dominates. Mm -hmm. Large companies should always consider low carbon care and service industry jobs alongside these priorities and place equal importance on them in their organizations. Uh, more to summarize on this subject, but I'll stop here. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Appreciate your being sensitive to the limited time we have. And your points have been very crisp and well made. And I cannot emphasize the importance financial institutions uh, have and the role they can play to make it easier for women business owners to get access to funds. So very crucial role to play across the globe. And thank you for doing what you're doing. Even at Renew, in our company, we've tied up with UNDP to support women entrepreneurs. So many stakeholders can play a role in different ways, but most importantly, financial institutions. Habiba, you were a part of the first cohort of female entrepreneurs winning the We Empower SDG Challenge. What role do female support networks uh, play on your part? Uh, and how are you paying it, paying it forward to support further other women. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, the good thing about the Women We Empower um, Climate uh, Competition was that uh, it, it came from it came from a place of what are women doing and how do we amplify what the women are doing. And this was taken. Uh, all of us were taken from one region, one UN region, to 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 represent our region and. Being the first of its kind at the time we won, it was quite exciting and quite um, 
enlightening, especially for me. I mean, I, I learned about technologies and uh, interventions that people were doing the world over that I had never heard anything about. And I remember um, uh, Shimrit Pekol of Blessed Memory now, um, who won with the work she's doing uh, to protect our oceans. I mean, oceans is not something I would ever think about to be a climate um, climate solution to help fight the climate change issues that we're looking at. I didn't think that um, bringing back the, the the sea life to what it should be would be that strong, that sort of that much of a strong effect. And um, learning that from somebody like Shimwick was um, quite enlightening, and also finding that in the same um, businesses that all of my fellow cohort members um, were doing. Just because we were able to have that network and you know be uh, in that platform and be shown off, quote unquote, at the uh, UN um, meetings in September of uh, 2018, ensured that some of us went on to do more of the work that we're doing in a bigger scale. And I know that Shimbridge for one won so many more awards after that. And uh, of course, what that meant was our work was also meaning that more tons of CO2 was being saved and our climate effects were reducing. For me, I was able to get more women on board to work with me in reducing you know, the climate effects of the technologies that we were preferring. And because we use women, we, we, we work with women as um, our sales force in communities, the, the winning of that uh, competition and also going on to be the global winner and getting the 40,000 from um, a, a person like uh, uh, Sorry, I forget her name now because I'm talking fast. But you know, just ensure that that, that money went to developing more women in um, uh, in in more communities. I was able to get more women to work with us, and that meant they had not just that they were reducing climate effects. It meant more economic opportunities for the women who we were working with. And I think this is for me a catalyst and a paying forward that could actually mean bigger things and you know just raising us there putting us in front of cwl i mean that's the council for world women leaders of the world was just what we needed at that point to build our business so still very thankful to we empower and the team that made it happen excellent habiba thank you and congratulations uh, again for that and uh, um final wrap question to both of you one female leader in climate action that inspires you uh, so I'll go to Chihan first and then Habiba. On, on, on. Okay, oh, yeah. it's my turn, right? Okay. Um, uh, there are many uh, female leaders who are transforming current uh, climate leadership, and I'm so glad to observe that uh, the list is getting longer and longer. But at the top of the list, um, I would mention New Zealand's Prime Minister, uh, Jacinda Ardern. Uh, she has laid out her priorities for the country stating her plans to urgently address climate change, uh, tackle inequality and improve, improving women's lives in the home and workplace. So she has made a, a noteworthy contribution to the cause of climate action. Yeah, thank thank you. you. It's always great to hear these names and that's the power of these networks where you really get to know people who are doing fantastic work. Thank you for that, uh, Habiba, your turn. Can you go on unmute, please, Habiba? Did you? Yeah, can you go on unmute it, uh, and name okay. of climate? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So I was talk about, I was reading some, I was reading recently about uh, Montin and Kimo. She's an indigenous activist and, uh, you know, um, and I, I really like what she is doing. She is doing, for me, it means a lot. And uh, it means that most of these actions that we're doing in the world, if they do not start from within and we do not take, um, you know, like responsibility from down and not just a top down approach, then there might be a long journey before we achieve what we want to achieve. So her taking a, a, the Ecuadorian government to court over its plan to sell in their territory to oil companies was just all that, you know, some of the things that we would need to ensure that um, uh, climate actions move forward. And I really, Excellent. really appreciate her for that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Habiba and Shihan for taking out the time Thank and you. sharing all this uh, valuable information for us and Thank expanding you. our knowledge base. Uh, it was really a great learning experience for me and I'm sure for all the audiences. 
once again, um, you know, heartfelt thank you for taking out the time. It's time to wrap up this session. We run a little bit over, uh, but um, you know, let me just um, uh, just um, you know summarize uh, you know what we've discussed. While we all acknowledge that gender equality is first and foremost a human rights imperative, many of my contemporaries aptly integrate the intersectional feminist lens to view the just transition. As we heard today, uh, as, as we head towards the COP in Glasgow, it's important that we integrate gender considerations in the climate action agenda. It's critical. As we conclude this brilliant session, I would like to thank you and Global Compact for, for putting together the session with some of the most eminent industry leaders who are paving the way to a holistic just transition. I would like to thank each one of the participants who took out the time to participate, comment, and engage. Before we conclude this session, there will be a short video message from Paloma Costa from the United Nations Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group on Climate. Dear O, thank you so much for having me in this important occasion. It is really an absolute honor to be here and to have the opportunity to be here gathered with you all. Well, young women and girls are widely known for being one of the most impacted groups when it comes to environmental catastrophes. The climate emergency is no different. This is mainly due to the primary role we play in our communities and our societies. So, it is essential that we, women and girls, have the opportunity to also participate in decision-making processes. How many women do we see occupying these spaces? Every child, every girl, every young woman should have the right to be free and to live in freedom. But this is not our reality. We still live in fear of our bodies and minds being corrupted. Our earth is our mother. We bleed with our blood. We care and nurture the environment we inhabit. Keeping this in mind, it makes us understand that both COP and CSW will be fundamental moments for us to re-earth our initiatives as humanity. Raising ambition for, for protecting all groups in our society. We can no longer leave no one behind. By the way, it is no longer acceptable for women and girls to be threatened by the simple fact that we were born women. So I invite, I invite all of you here, children of your mothers, grandchildren of so many witches in our stories, to reflect and accept that our place as a woman is whatever we want it to be. We are the daughters of resistance and the mothers of the revolution. So again, I invite all of you to look around and ensure our place with the certainty that when we talk about gender equality, about giving a space to marginalized voices, we are talking about the future and the present of our society. Future is indeed female. So better we arrive there together, right? <laughs>